Yeah. Okay. Then uh, let's continue with part two. Um, at the end of part one, we talked about how this universal core is conveyed in stories. And in this part, we will take a look at the creation story in the Eddas. And we are going to look at how the universe, the earth and man, was created. For this, we are going to look mainly at Gilfeginning, a piece from the Prose Edda, and Voluspa and Grimnismal from the Poetic Edda. And in Grimnismal, Odin and Frigga discuss which of two brothers is the best, which one of those two are, is the most virtuous. And in, Odin, uh, in this story, Odin tells uh, a lot about the structure of the world. In Voluspa's, one of the um, well-known poems. This one is about the beginning and the end of the world and shows some, something about the cyclicity of existence, but also the structure of the universe. In Gilfeginning, uh, King Gilfi uh, sp speaks with high, half high and third in the realm of the gods. And Gilfi asks questions and receives answers from, uh, from these three figures. And in this way, the structure and workings of the universe are made visible. These three figures stand together, uh, together stand for Odin, and you can also see them in, uh, in this image. They all look the same. At the bottom, you see Har, which means high. Then you see Jafnhar, which means equally high. And above the and uh, above that you see 3D, which means third. This is probably a good moment to say some more about the language in which the poems and stories are written. Because if you want to read the Old Norse texts in their original form, this is partially possible. In English, some of the words might be familiar, like the name 3D, meaning third because a part of this English, English language originates from the Old Frisian and Anglo-Saxon region, which was the Old Germanic region. And in some words, this link is still visible. The only characters in the poems that are probably strange to us are these two, but we do know them as sounds, like thing and there. It's basically the th sound. Another phenomenon is that gods ha uh, often have various names. A name or nickname is also called a haiti. So Har, Jafnhar and Thridi are names of or nicknames of Odin. Next to this we have kennings. And these are more like cryptic descriptions. For example, user of the strength belt with this sentence the god Thor is meant. He's the god of thunder and wears a metal strength belt which which doubles his electric power. But Haiti and Kennings are not only for gods. They can also they can be for all kinds of things actually. Like horse of the sea is a boat and roof over the earth is the sky. I'm telling you this for two reasons. First, because we will see more of this in the lecture. And secondly, if you want to study the Eddas yourselves. What you see a lot in different traditions is that the core message is not just explained explicitly. It is always conveyed through symbolism and comparison. And this is also the case in the Eddas. And I think that these Haiti and Kennings create a healthy delay. People really have to chew on the material. It needs to be examined from various perspectives. And then, after having given it much thought, it becomes clear what is really meant by it. This effect is, of course, very different compared to just being given the message. And in this, in this previous learning process, you've seen a lot more because you have looked at the ideas from many angles, which makes this journey very rich and broad. But first and foremost, 
you have been actively learning. And this active attitude is very important if we really truly want to grow as a human being. So if you want to learn more about the Eddas, be prepared to chew on the material a lot. Let's move on to the story of creation and let's see how the Eddas, goes, uh, the Eddas go about this. In the Eddas, creation begins with Ginnen Chachap, which means the void abyss. An endless space without beginning and end. And this concept is known in Theosophia with the first proposition. That there is an omnipresent, eternal, boundless and immutable principle. One absolute reality which antecedes all manifested, conditioned being. This is described in the proem of Blavatsky's book, The Secret Doctrine. But you can also recognize this concept in Buddhism with Sunyata or the Greek tradition with Apairum. This principle or Genunchachap consists of two forces, Muspelheim and Niflheim. Muspelheim is a warm and fiery region and represents active spiritual fire. Niflheim is cold and icy and represents the passive material side. They are like Parabrahman and Mula Prakriti in the secret doctrine. But Geninchachap is both forces. It carries both forces within itself. As every living being is composed of the same polarity, a human being is also composed of spirit and matter. He has an inner mind and heart and has a physical body in which this spirit is clothed. In the background of Ginnun Chachap, an invisible force slowly begins to stir, by which first the first being emerges. This is Audumla. She is also ca uh, called the melodious cow. She is a cow and a feminine symbol. She stands for fertility and creation, and she is the mother of all beings, whether they are human beings or gods. She is the mother of all life. She is the cosmic soul or the oversoul, and the cosmic mother of all things that have not yet been created. In the world of symbolism, you can see the invisible force in Ghanem Chachap as the divine thought of All Father. This is in motion and needs something to express itself through. This divine thought needs a voice, and that is Audumla, the soul or voice of the divine thought. From Niflheim, space is filled with ice, and by the sparks that come from Muspelheim, the ice melts, and from this, a new being is born. The ice that grows in Genunchachap comes from Vergelmeer. And from Vergelmeer flows rivers, flow rivers that are called Elivagar. When these rivers fo flow far from their source, or from this well, they become ice. And this ice grows further and further layer upon layer towards Genunchachap. From Muspelheim, come those glowing sparks. And because of this heat, the ice melts, and from these drops together form the frost giant Ymir. Ymir stands for cosmic matter, the substance with which will be built later on. Ymir is fed uh, of the four milk streams of uh, Audumla. And Audumla herself also ate. She fed, fed on the salty ice blocks from Niflheim. By licking those salty ice blocks, in three days a new creature emerged. He is called Buri. 
and the first day his hair was, was licked out of the ice, and the second day his head, and the third day his whole body was free. Buri is the first divine being. In the meantime, there's been activity with Ymir. From Ymir sprang various creatures. From his feet came forth more primitive frost giants. And from the height of his torso came forth two other kinds of giants, Besla and Mimir. I think that this height from which these beings were created of Ymir indicates a certain quality of these beings. Because also in the stories of the Eddas, Besla and Mimir play a very different role than those frost giants that were created at his feet. The frost giants are very primitive beings, while Besla eventually becomes the mother of Odin, and Mimir even becomes Odin's wise counselor, who teaches Odin the runes of wisdom. But we will come back to this later in the lecture. On the other side, according to some unknown process that is not described in any of those stories, Buri has a son, who is named Bor. And finally, Bor and Besla have three sons together, and these are Odin, Ve, and Vili. They are the first outward expression of Allfather, the power that is in and behind Genunchagap. Allfather is the father of all, and he has created through the mother, the oversoul Audumla, a son. This divine thought has expressed through speech a word. Allfather is actually a Haiti of Odin. So Odin was actually already active in the background of Genunchagap, but has now taken shape in a more external plane. Odin, Ve, and Vili are the architects who continue to work to create the world. And the following will now happen. In the text of the Eddas, it is said that Odin, Ve, and Vili kill the frost giant Ymir, and that out of his remains the world is created. But like the other things and events, this killing is symbolic. It is actually a way of saying that one part start leading over the other. In this case, the spiritual fire of Odin, Ve, and Vili start leading the passive cosmic matter, which is Ymir, which results in that this cosmic matter is being structured. You could say that the divine thought of Allfather is getting more and more shape. It is starting to express itself through the cosmic matter. The basic cosmic matter is used to create the world. And from his flesh, earth, uh, earth and soil is made. And from his sweat, the ocean. These are the elemental aspects of the world. From his bones and teeth, the mountains and stones are made, the mineral realm. And from his hair, the plants. All of these layers are material and physically visible. The next parts are different in this respect. From his blood is made a sea, and this sea, according to the Eddas, lies like a ring around the earth. Now blood is a symbol for desire, and these two things combined made me think of the sphere, the sphere that lies between the Earth and the Moon, the so-called Kamaloka area, or also called the Desire area. When we look at the head of Ymir, other things are made of that. Of his skull, for example, is made the heavenly vault, supported by four pillars, which represent the four cardinal points. As you can see, this area lies beyond the sea. And from his brain, the clouds are made. And these, perhaps, could be, uh, uh, they could represent the thoughts that pass by. And finally, from the eyebrows or eyelids, which one of the two, wo two words is not very clear, a protective ring is made around the earth. 
and this ring protects the Earth, or Midgarth, from Jotuns. Cosmic influences that would crush us. Elsa Brita Ticinel, author of the book uh, The Masks of Odin, links this protective barrier to the Van Allen radiation belts. These are two arc-shaped belts that are within the magnetic uh, field of the Earth and protect our atmosphere from destruction. At this point, the architects have built the Earth, or Midgarth. It's also called Midgarth. And we move on to the next chapter, and that is the creation of man. Odin, Ve, and Vili continue to build. Only in this phase, Ve and Vili are called differently. In this phase of creating man, they are called Hunar and Lothar. And as mentioned earlier, gods often have multiple names. They stand for the same forces, but at different phases of development. So when a new phase of development is introduced, the name of the god or force changes in the Eddas. For example, Thor, another god in the Eddas, he is called Trud, Trud at the universe level, Thor in the solar system, and Lorite on the earthly level. But Thor's power reaches through or is interwoven throughout all of the universe, so to say. His power is reflected on all different levels of being in the universe. This is the case with all of the gods or forces. The same way that the essence of Odin flows and reaches throughout all life, including ourselves. Let's look at a passage in the Eddas about the creation of man. On the land they found, empty of might, ask an embla, without fate. And that they, uh, they had not, other they had not, no la, nor motion, no letter goda. And gave Odin, other gave Hunar, la, gave Lothar, and also Litter Goda. Ask and Embla are names for trees. I believe those are maple and alder. And from these trees, people are made. Odin, Hunar, and Lothar gave Ask and Embla things. And later I will explain what the gifts are, but let's first look at what it is that they gave. They gave, the man, uh, they gave man Efni. The northerners did not see man as divided into spirit, soul, and body, in which the soul would hang as a sort of gradient between the spirit and body. They did not even see a separation between spirit and matter. Only living units existed for the northerners. Units where consciousness and matter are one and inseparable, like living building blocks. And these living building blocks they called Efni, which to me sounds very similar to the concept of monads in Theosophy. Those eternal points of consciousness that are infinitely developing and growing in how to express their inner potential. These Efni could be coarse and, and fine, tangible or intangible, visible and invisible, all on different stages of development, but whatever stage, they are units. And the human being in the Eddas is a combination of multiple of these living, active units of Efni. This is what Odin, Hunar and Lothar gave of themselves to human beings. Odin gave Ant, a divine Efni. He breathed life into man and gave inner essence to man, the very highest and best that man can be and become. The next gift is the Haminya. This is a spiritual Efni, our inspiring inner guide in life. 
In the stories, she is described like an armored maiden who helps us in the background to stay on the right track in life, to be strong and move onwards, while at the same time being loving, supportive, and compassionate towards others. She gives us advice in, in the form of intuitions or whisperings from our conscience. This is a gift from Urth, one of the Norns, and I will tell more about Urth and the Norns in the next part of this lecture. So we'll move on to the next. Next comes the gift of Hunar, Oder. This ethne corresponds with our higher thinking. That part in us which helps us with understanding and in intelligence. The word Hunar suggests a bird. And there's a story attached to this that we still know today. Namely the one of the stork at birth. The story goes that a stork takes fruits from a pond and brings them to pregnant women. And these fruits have grown on the world tree Utrasil. And when these fruits are ripe, they fall into a pond, and Hunar fishes these fruits out of the pond. And then he brings them to women who are expecting. In this way, he, give, he gives each person his odor fruit, or odor ethni. Litter and la are two gifts from Loder. Litter represents the lower thinking in man, the lower manas. This thinking is earthbound and has a more limited scope and range than the higher thinking. Higher thinking is about insight and understanding beyond oneself, a larger scope. And the lower thinking is more limited to oneself, often attached in a way to desire, a smaller scope. But to be clear, each part, each ethne, has its own scope. But each ethne has also its own unique uh, purpose. Each ethne fulfills a role in our ex existence and can be lined up to do good. It all depends on how we direct our constitution and how we choose to work with our inner assembly of ethnes. The next gift is la, which means, again, blood, blood, the force of desire. The power to take action and to achieve something. Last, we have the gifts of emir. These parts make up our physical body, the energy that flows through our body, our basic senses, and the outer human form that we can see with our eyes. These parts we have received from Ymir, because the first humans that were found were trees, and these came into being during the creation of the earth from his remains. It is these primitive human plants that were elevated to more developed human life. And from this point on, everything is created and ready to take on life. The universe is created, the earth is created, and man, which results in this tree of life. It is Utrasil, the world tree, and there is a lot to see in this picture, and we will uh, save these contents for part three. So I've told a lot, and let's have a break first before we move on to part three. And if you have questions, feel free to ask them through chat or email them to us. Uh, we'll have a short break of three minutes. Welcome back, everyone. Erin, did we receive more questions? Yes, a few questions, uh, also from a theosophical perspective. Uh, you explained that the, the people from Norse mythology did not distinguish that much between spirit and matter. Uh, but you have these ethne of... Uh, can, can you explain a bit? Um, it's not that the lower ethne is more material, material than a higher or or can, can you tell something more about it yeah all of those ethnies at least when you look at the uh, constitution of man all those orbs you saw in the slide all of those are separate ethnies composed of matter and spirit mm -hmm. 
But all of those are like living entities that are also traveling, but traveling with us. Mm. So those are all, um, consciousness and matter are inseparable there. So they, they are all entities that have this consciousness part and this matter part, but those are always combined. It doesn't only stand for consciousness or only for matter. It's always the two combined, but on their own plane and their own phase of development. So could you compare it like um, the people that perhaps know the egg diagram from the Baruka in the, in the fundamentals, that all the ethni are really uh, linked together uh, with in one stream of consciousness, really working together, yeah. forming well, this composite I think entity? It's, I think it's exactly that. Hmm. Yeah, I cannot say more, <laughs> more about it. I, I, I think it's exactly the same. Yeah. And especially the egg diagram is a very um, uh, good way in, in which it is described, I think. Yeah. Uh, another question more about uh, cosmology. cosmology. Um, so you explained that uh, Odin, uh, in the form of All Father, was already there with the, at the start of creation um, before expressing himself in creation. Can you, can you tell a bit more about that? Yes. Um, at the beginning, he is called All Father, and I think that is a very suitable name and very correct in this sense because he uh, was already uh, present at the moment there was something that was stirring in Genun Gechap. So actually, he, as I understood it, he is in and behind Genun Gechap, this force, that divine thought that is staring to express itself and through the cow he um, he expresses uh, well uh, and everything unfolds but all father is in that sense really all father because he's the father of all he is the starting point from which everything starts but uh, it's probably because i think he's similar to the first logos and that is not visible the the first logos is unseen and that is why you don't see something in Genun Gechab. But in theosophy, we know there's this force staring, mm. trying to express itself. Uh, and that is, I think, all father in and behind Genun Gechab. Because if you say in uh, Genun Gechab, you explained, you could compare to the, the first proposition, the, um, the boundless. And so... Uh, all father with the first logos so that's the first um yeah um conscious appearance within a certain uh cosmos universe yes that, that more or less emanates exactly but not in a visible way the first logos is uh, described as not visible the second as semi-visible and the third as fully visible and uh, you could say that those three brothers, Odin, Vili, and Ve, are the really expressed version. That Audumla, the cow, is like the semi... Um, uh, or the second locus. Yeah, yes, and, and Allfather is the first, that, uh, which is not visible. Mm -hmm. That's also why I chose in the slide not to show him anywhere. Because, it, yeah, he's not visible. <laughs> okay, yeah. I see. Um a question uh, comes in in Dutch, so I, I have to translate. translate. So, uh, can you find the um, terms reincarnation and karma in the Eddas? Uh, symbolically, they, they uh, seem to appear. Um, and can you also find um, some ethical consequences there to apply in daily life? I think those are various questions in one, but let's, uh, as I understood it, uh, first about the terms, uh, like... Uh, reincarnation, reincarnation and karma, the idea is more or yeah. less, yeah. Well, it's very clearly uh, visible that they take this as a starting point. I, I, I don't know if they really use a word for it, but they even, for example, even put on hell shoes on the people that die, because they believe that after death they will move on and need good shoes when they go through the, the pits, you know. 
so to say. And um, also, uh, karma is very visible. We will get back to that later. But when we look at the norns, um, the, those are actually the sisters of fate, the fates, also known in other traditions. Um, those are very clearly also about karma. Uh, and also, those norns, when they... Um, 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 make up the balance, how do you say, uh, weigh everything. Um, former lives are included in this. This is also very visible. They look over lives. They, they don't just look at one life, but they include all former lives. Well, you will see more about this in, uh, in the next part. There is more. Uh, and, and it, it's right that um, they, uh, I don't know, maybe you will tell in part three, this idea of cyclicity also from the uh, standpoint from the cosmos, right? That the world will end and also be renewed again, the world. Yeah, this is not, this, this part is not um, uh, in part three, or this uh, topic is not in part three. But if you want to read more about that, uh, you can read it in Voluspa. That really clearly shows that there is this start of the universe and also describes somewhat how it is built. Um, and at some point, the whole thing topples over and then the world is destroyed. And at the end, you will see that a new world emerges, which is further developed and evolved. A new, yeah, well, how do you say, a better, ver a better version of itself, basically. Yeah, so right. There you see this concept of cyclic evolution. Yes, on a cosmic yes, scale. That on is. a cosmic yeah. scale, also. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Those were the questions for now. Okay. Let's move on uh, with part three. In this part, we are going to look at Utrecht.